How's it going, everybody? This is Beat the Bush. This is the Cycle N Bats Mini Lithium Iron Phosphate Battery. It's the 12.8 volt, 100 amp version. And if you use these things before, you know that normally for this capacity, it's a lot bigger than this. Here's an example. It's called a Group 31. I've done a lot of teardowns and I often wonder why do they leave so much space inside? Cycle N Bat has essentially taken out all the dead empty space and turned it into this mini thing right here. Roughly 45% less volume here. Having a standard size is important if you have a predefined space for this type of battery already. If you're putting it into a general storage area, you want them side by side, you want them as dense as possible, then going with a mini will allow you to fit in more batteries, fit in more capacity. So if you don't need a standard size, I would recommend going with a mini because it's just more dense. Your standard battery weighs 22.4 pounds and the cycle and battery weighs 20.6 pounds. That's a whole 1.8 pounds less for the same capacity. You have your product manual, charge instructions, precautions, greeting card from the brand and the warranty card. It comes with a set of 30 millimeter bolts and a set of 17 millimeter bolts, each with their own set of washers. Putting in the short one, it fits just right. And the long one will allow you to attach more things to the terminal. Here it bottomed out already, so you get this much more room to bolt things on. Discharging it all the way down to 10.1 volts, I got a capacity of 102 amp hours. 2% more, the capacity is verified. When I charged it, it went from 10.8 volts all the way to 14.5, and I was able to put in 102 amp hours as well. Now let's do a load test. It's supposed to be able to sustain 300 amps for five whole seconds. My 3000 watt inverter, I can only do 234 amps at most. So let's see how long that can last running at my maximum. I'm gonna turn this on, 224 amps. I started the timer there. Let's see how long it's gonna take before it cuts out. It's certainly not sensing the current. It's waiting for something to heat up too much before it cuts off the output. So I got three minutes and 30 seconds. That's pretty good. Let me use a thermal imager. The negative cable got plenty hot at 185. The positive terminal is at 123. The BMS is like right underneath here and that's around 150 degrees on the outside. So it heat up too much and it cut itself off. Normally this meter will turn on on its own. 4.7 volts, so it appears it cut itself off. We have to wait until it cools off naturally before it re-engages itself. The battery will prevent charging if it's below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Usually batteries will get damaged if you charge when the temperature is too low. So if it's ever too cold, you need to warm up the battery first before we can start charging. When it's discharging though, it can operate between minus four and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. I saw up here that it was like around 150 degrees Fahrenheit. That's why it cut itself off. A few minutes has passed and it turned itself back on. The battery still feels a little warm, but cool enough to operate. If you're not pushing it to the max, you can still discharge it continuously until it's completely empty at 100 amps. They have their own label on their BMS. It's a 100 amp charging and discharging BMS. Likely they want you to only charge and discharge nominally at 20 amps. 4S lithium ion phosphate battery protection board. So there's four cells in series. Label will turn red when wet. Let's just put a little dot of water in there. Right there, oh, okay, it does turn red. Okay, let's get that out of there. Let's try to take this out further. It is glued at the bottom right there. I was just able to peel it off. Very little extra space here. Just this tiny piece of foam on this side and on the other side. So basically all filled up with battery. And this is glued down onto the top of the terminals. Here we have our four cells, one, two, three, four, the five voltage sense lines, the negative, positive, and the three in between. The terminals are welded in place in series. So this is the first cell, second, third, fourth. It appears that I'm not gonna structurally affect anything if I just put this back on without having to glue it back on. It won't be on there as well as before, of course. There's also a temperature wire that goes in here. And the temperature probe is actually over here. 
There it is, the bimetal thing. There's only one temperature probe on this thing, and they use a lot of caulk on everything, including on the terminals, gluing the boards together, gluing these fiberglass boards on top of the terminals. That just gives it a little bit of extra heat protection because it does contact this shell and it might melt that if it gets too hot. There are two eight gauge wires. The positive terminal goes to one of the cells and it strings four of them up over here. At the output of that is the negative terminal. So without this BMS in between, it's just gonna supply as much current as it ever wants. But you put this BMS in between here, there's a whole bunch of FETs that is essentially like an electronic switch that can connect between these terminals and the output terminals. So when it's working very well, it's connected directly from here to here with a low ohmic resistance, and that would drive whatever you have connected to these terminals. My lights right now are powered off of this battery. It's drawing 107 watts right now. The temperature sensor is right here. Let's cool it down. The battery works all the way to minus four. So if we cool it down enough, the lights turn off, it gets cut off. The temperature sensor is going to warm back up on its own, and now it starts back up again. There we go. If you guys are interested in having a denser battery, check out my affiliate link down in the video description below. Thanks for watching this video. Until next time.